Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this event on Democracies in Crisis, European and Latin American Perspectives. I am very glad to welcome you here. I am Brigitte Britta Weifen. Uh, I am currently uh, holding the Martius Chair for German and European Studies, Cathedra Martius de Estudios Alemães y Europeos, here at the uh, University of Sao Paulo. It's connected to the Political Science Department. And um, it's a visiting professorship that is sponsored by the German Academic Exchange Service, uh, DAAD. Um, and the idea of this is to um, increase econo uh, academic exchange between Germany and Brazil and more broadly Europe and Latin America and also to, um, yeah, to initiate research on topics with relation to Europe, with relation to Germany and with a comparative perspective between the two regions or the two countries. And so besides doing my teaching and research I organize quite a few events that bring together Brazilian, German scholars and beyond um, to talk about these issues. Um, so the event today is uh, tackling a current um, challenge, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute in my own presentation, so I don't want to go into too much detail, just a little bit where this is coming from. Uh, for quite a while I've been working on the topic of democracy promotion by regional organizations, comparing Latin America and also Europe. Um, and uh, two years ago, about two years ago, I published a book on the organization of American states and how it dealt with crisis of democracy in the Americas. So I kind of came from this perspective more from the area of international relations and external interventions in uh, democratization processes. However, when I did the research on this question, already starting with this during the time of my dissertation almost 10 years ago and then continuing with this book that was published two years ago, um, I realized it's also that the question that is at the borderlines between international relations and comparative politics. And this is what makes it for me especially interesting. Um, and so looking at it from the international relations perspective, to look at the organizations and what mechanisms they have to protect democracies is one thing. The other thing is, of course, to define the object that is in crisis, to really think about democratic development in member states, um, to reflect on how can we actually perceive um, or how can we actually conceptualize democratic development and crisis of democracy, which is often quite unreflectedly used in the debate on international reactions uh, to these crises. And so when going through the literature and also debating with colleagues such as Wolfgang Merkel from Germany, we've been in contact about this topic for quite a while, and I realized that there are quite different ideas when looking at Latin America and looking at Europe and the scholars that discuss crisis in Europe and crisis in Latin America, had quite different ideas of what they mean by a crisis of democracy. Um, and so I think this uh, was kind of the initiating uh, thought for, for the event, to, to look at crisis of democracy from a comparative perspective. Um, and um, so the, the major uh, intention of this event is to start from a theoretical conceptual perspective and see what is out there in terms of crisis theories, does that help us in any way to define crisis of democracy and um, if it's not yet satisfying, what could we do to conceptualize crisis better, to make it a better term that is manageable for doing comparative research. <clears throat> and secondly, of course, um, the idea is to study, to look at concrete cases or at concrete developments in Europe and in Latin America from a comparative perspective, both uh, comparing different types or variants of crisis to explore whether crises look different in Europe than in Latin America, and also secondly to study the causes of crisis and also again explore whether the causes are the same in Europe and Latin America or whether there are significant differences between the two regions. So this, in a nutshell, is the motivation and the aims of this conference. Um, and again, I would like to welcome you. I would like to thank the Instituto de Estudos Avanzados for hosting the event and for participating in the, all the preparations and all the organization. 
And uh, I hand over to Jose Alvaro Moises now to say welcome from his side. Well, good morning to everybody. Thank you for coming here, to be here. I just want to welcome our participants, particularly our guests, our invites from the north side of Brazil that are bringing their experience and their research. And just one word about the team that, uh, in a sense, uh, Brita has already presented, in, in which sense we want to develop and go in this morning. And I would say that, uh, in a sense, uh, after the three decades of the last century, in which we had this enormous development of democratization, uh, for instance, uh, the, the intelligent unity of economists would say that we have at least half of the countries around the world that are already democratic. But, obviously, not only the process of democratization is, in a sense, uh, uh, homogeneous in the sense that the, all countries that have achieved a democratic definition are actually democratic, but at the same time, we did have some retreats in the last, uh, at least, uh, I would say, in the two first decades of, the, of this century. Some countries are actually defined as uh, illiberal, semi-democracies or hy hybrid kind of democracies, and some others are quite clearly going in the direction of restoring uh, dictatorship or eventually some kind of authoritarian uh, experience. I would mention Russia, Venezuela, and Turkey. Uh, although in the case of Turkey, uh, I, mean, uh, I suppose we will be in the debate, it might be some specifications to more detail about the situation. But I mentioned this just to say that uh, in this context, international context, in, in which we have to compare to actually see what is the actual uh, definition of a crisis, if it, it is really applicable to all countries that were mentioned, I would say that uh, we have this picture by which political parties and the representation, specific institutions of representation, are very much criticized and very much in a critical position, not only because, in a sense, there is a dialogue of uh, political participation, a, a, a retreat on civic uh, uh, votes, people are voting less, and even in, in the sort of more uh, uh, stable democracies, not, not only the new, but also the older democracies. And in a sense, this puts some new challenge uh, that goes not only in terms of the empirical experience, but also in terms of the theoretical possibility of defining this. Uh, uh, I think that it is, is very important to go in, into this new experience. Even so, uh, I would say that sometimes there are a tendency to define as crisis of democracy, because in some countries, in particular in more developed countries, <laughs> in which democracy is more old, there is a, a, a tendency by uh, the electoral results of uh, <coughs> uh, experiences more in, in a conservative kind of tendency. And I don't think it's a good start to define the crisis by looking at countries that are all right-wing or have defined by electoral uh, definitions to be in a position that is more conservative. Maybe we should go in a sort of more deep uh, analysis to understand the, the real nature of the crisis and to understand whether uh, democracies are able to ev evolve and in a sense to change this pattern of uh, that it, many people uh, tend to interpret as a crisis. So welcome to everybody. I think we are going to have a very critical discussion on the different issues of this uh, related to, this, to, to the main team. And uh, I just want to, to uh, wish to everybody a very good uh, seminar, very good debate. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all for being here in this uh, quite interesting event. 
uh, organized by the IEA and by the Cathedral uh, von Martius. My job here is the easy one, I'm just presenting. Uh, so let me introduce you Professor Wolfgang Merkel, um, which, we, which he will be talking about conceptualizing the crisis of democracy. Um, Professor Merkel works at the Berlin Social Science, Science Center, which is a non-university research institute. More specifically, uh, he is director of the Democracy and Democratization Research Unit. He has been in such position for the last 13 years now, since uh, 2004. And uh, in, in this uh, center, they focus in uh, research on interactions between political actors and uh, democracy and on the capacities of young democracies to solve economic and social problems. He is as well professor of comparative political science at the Democracy Research uh, Humboldt University. And uh, he is now head of two ongoing <coughs> research projects, I would say fairly large research projects. The first one, uh, a project called Against Elite, Against Outsiders, Sources of Democracy, democracy Critique, Immigration Critique and Right-Wing Populism. Yesterday we had the opportunity to hear some findings about this project. And the second um, fairly large project, which they call within the research unit of the professor Bridge Projects, is the political sociological, uh, the political sociology of cosmo cosmopolitanism and communitarianism. We have also heard yesterday some, some findings, some positions about uh, emerging of this project. Uh, Professor Merkel has a number of books and articles published, and uh, all of them in, in the research fields that uh, Professor Merkel work in, which are political regimes, democracy, dictatorships, democratization, political parties, and social democracy, social justice. So this is for Professor Merkel, and I may wait to present Brigitte Ward before he, he talks, okay? So the, the dynamic it's it's quite simple. We are wait, we are expected to have uh, presentations between 15 and 20 minutes. So I'm just signaling your time when we have like 15 minutes. Is that okay for you? Don't be 20, but I can do it. Yes. No, just 15. Then you can have more five. It's just an advice to let you I don't want summarize. To summarize. Okay, okay, and. Um, and then we open the floor to the floor and for the debate within the audience and within among the, the panelists. So, Professor Merkel, please. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, good morning to everybody. I immediately jump into my presentation, or not immediately. I pick up one point uh, Jose Alvaro mentioned. Uh, in his brief uh, remarks at the beginning, that we are observing some kind of retreat of democracy during the last two decades. Mm -hmm. How do we know it? Is it enough to point at Russia, which was never, according to my point of view, a democracy, and to point to Turkey now, which had tremendous problems as what I would call a defective democracy. Is it not something we have constructed as a cognitive trap uh, in being overly optimistic and measuring democracy, uh, democ democracies in the 1990s? Uh, so sometimes it seems to me we had this euphoric uh, ideas, even if we criticized again and again Fukuyama, but uh, in a way we thought it's going up and up and up, and then we had certainly a period, period of stagnation. Uh, I will show you the cognitive map. So this is a cognitive map which leads me actually to, to my uh, brief presentation. I will talk. Uh, I will talk about uh, democracy. What do we mean by democracy? <coughs> Simply, it is a contested concept. Then I will talk 
about the concepts of crisis we know, or let's put it this way, the term of crisis we are using, as you will see very briefly in a moment, that I do uh, think that we do not have a concept, an analytical concept for a crisis of democracies, then I will show you what I think crisis theories can explain and cannot explain, and uh, I will pre present finally three different strategies which have to combine in order to test uh, the crisis hypothesis. Uh, a colleague of ours uh, has counted more than 500 adjectives if it comes to democracy, liberal, representative, guided, directed, repressive, uh, defective, or whatever uh, democracies. But if we do it, uh, reduce the complexity very simply, one could distinguish these different concepts of democracy or group it in three categories. Minimalists uh, in the tradition of Schumpeter and the early downs. Uh, and uh, then mid-range uh, minimalists are arguing it's all about elections. Elections are not only at the core element of democracy, elections are democracy itself. Then a uh, uh, theoretician uh, who think it's not only about input, it's input but also the institutions and <coughs> procedures we connect to the throughput in an Estonian uh, sense. And then we have maximalists who uh, argue it's about input, throughput, and the performance, the output of the political regime. What I want to say here, it depends very much which is your starting concept of democracy, because this determines to some extent whether democracy is in crisis or not. Minimalists will hesitate very often to see uh, democracy in crisis where maximalists uh, see, so to say, a permanent crisis of uh, democracy. So uh, the hypothesis goes, the more minimalist, the less crisis, and vice versa. However, I think uh, in uh, at present, it is simply inappropriate uh, to use a minimalist concept because elections may be intact, uh, even in some kind of hybrid regimes, even to some extent in electoral authoritarianism, but many other dimensions, especially the rule of law dimension, minority rights and so forth, are uh, in uh, are under challenges which uh, the democratic procedures have not solved so far. So it depends very much uh, which is your uh, root concept of democracy where you start your uh, analysis. Uh, I don't uh, go through the whole concept. This is a concept I am using. It is not only a normative concept, uh, it is an analytical concept, concept, and it's made up of five different partial regimes of democracy. The core is clear. These are, this is the electoral regimes, but in order to make democratic elections democratically meaningful, these elections have to be embedded. They have to be embedded in additional political regimes, they have to be a um, guarantee of political rights, uh, and political rights are not very uh, important and relevant if they are not a guarantee of civil rights, Though, so both uh, uh, regimes have to be intact, have to work, and then we have the checks and balances or horizontal accountability, which is something we are seeing at present challenged in some of the most developed democracies even. And uh, the fifth partial regime sounds a bit strange to somebody. Uh, it means do the authorities we have elected in democratic elections indeed the power to govern. 
or do we have other actors or arenas like deregulated markets which uh, determine to a large extent political decision, decisions and monetary uh, uh, policies, fiscal policies and so forth? Or are they, uh, do we have supranational regimes uh, which govern our uh, democratic life more than domestic political systems? And in the corners, you have prototypically uh, some kind of challenges democracy uh, has to um, master and has to solve these problems, and I don't go now into these different challenges. I said at the beginning, uh, we are using uh, in social sciences or in, in political science uh, probably uh, none of the terms more often than crisis. However, I do not find it uh, very much uh, defined uh, and therefore I am distinguishing between two different types of crisis at least in a two different meanings we are using uh, the term. The first one is a classical metaphorical uh, meaning uh, taken from uh, uh, the medicine, the medical sciences and this is a question of life and death. It is a question of existence and non-existence. Uh, this is a typical and classical term. It is a question of survival. Uh, political regimes uh, so my argument goes, or democratic regimes uh, are in crisis if there is a crossroad situation where these regimes can collapse. This is the understanding what uh, the uh, historians and philosophers have <laughs> developed out of the 17th century if they are when they are writing about uh, crisis. And there is also an uh, additional point. It's not only a crossroad uh, situation, but decisions have to be done. And these decisions are decisive whether a um, political regime survives or not. We have clear examples uh, where uh, democracy or democratic regimes collapsed, where we could at least say ex post, there was a certain period uh, where these regimes were in crisis before they collapsed, and I don't run through all these examples I have written here. But we use the term much more often in a more diff diffuse way, <laughs> meaning there is some kind of latent crisis. There is a slow decline. There are we observing erosions of the quality of democracy. We are uh, seeing unfulfilled normative prom promises of democracy. So it is about erosion, and it's not something where we would say this is a classical crossroad situation, an existential, existential threat uh, to uh, democracy. But my main criticism, or what I think it's a main deficit of all these thinkings and concepts of crisis, that nobody has ever defined where is the threshold. When does a crisis begin? When does it end? And if we are continuously talking about the crisis of democracy, then it is probably the normal state. Then the, the term is semantically paradox. And it's clear here again, if we use the uh, meaning of an acute crisis of democracy, we certainly have a small sub-sample only uh, a small sample among the democratic regimes, but if we use it in a more diffuse way, then you can come up then with Germany and how somehow 
France are in crisis because right-wing populism is emerging. And uh, it is something which is analytically, at least to me, completely unclear. I don't go through it because I have 50 minutes. Uh, I just want to say we have here, you have exemplarily uh, four different uh, theories of crisis by Habermas and Offe, basically a legitimacy crisis uh, driven by uh, problems of capitalism. You have the famous uh, Grossier, uh, Watanuki, Huntington overload crisis of big governments. Big governments are no longer able to govern because they have too many things they have to govern. And then you have the post-democratic situation by Colin Crouch and others. And Huntington, uh, late Huntington's, uh, one of his latest books, he simply is seeing the, the base of a political regime, the political community is eroding. Uh, this is a highly problematic uh, book. I, again, I don't go into it. All, none of these four types really solves the threshold question. They don't say something about it, and this is, uh, what I think is missing if we are using crisis as an analytical concept. And again, uh, we discussed it yesterday. I'm anyway, I, I'm highly critical against the way of talking about crisis of democracy. There are some varieties of democracy, and uh, you mentioned before. Freedom House or others are counting 120 electoral democracies. And if you add rule of law based democracy, probably is only the half of it. So uh, there are quite different democracies, let's say, uh, between, I wouldn't say Hungary again to provoke a discussion with Jan Werner, but between Scandinavian uh, states and let's say. Uh, Chile or Argentina. There are certainly uh, differences. The second point I want to mention we, uh, are we do not have a theory how we deal with this simultaneous development. Meaning, on the one side, in certain partial regimes, in certain dimensions of democracy, we have seen during the last decades and quite impressive improvements. If we look to the gender question, if we look to minority rights, and so forth. The rule of law has uh, uh, been strengthened quite a lot during this time. On the other hand, uh, we have certainly problematic developments like the deregulation of markets, uh, which disempower so it was to some extent a democratic disempowerment of political regimes by deregulating markets which could not and cannot any longer be really governed by democratic decisions. The role of central banks is something uh, which comes into play here as well. So we uh, do not have a clear theory when uh, for different and diverging developments in one and the same democratic regime. One can look to the crisis. This is a kind of analytical proposal I'm doing that we have three levels of analysis. The first one is we ask the people, the demos, what do they think about they are a democracy. This is a classical liberian legitimacy belief. Do they think uh, the political regimes or specific institutions are uh, still, uh, the people still believe that they are legitimate? We can have a kind of situation where they believe the regime is legitimate, but they do not grant the same democratic legitimacy, let's say, to political parties, for example. 
The second one is we have to ask uh, the normative specialists, uh, scholars on democracy, and we have these different indices of measuring the quality of democracy. So they are the experts on the normative dimension because it can be that the people believe the regime is legitimate. Uh, however, uh, experts would say this is already some kind of autocratic regime. If you would have a kind of uh, uh, mass survey 1936 in Germany, probably you would have gotten a majority of the people thinking this regime is legitimate. And you will have probably a majority in Hungary and maybe even in Turkey. So it's certainly not enough. We have to look to the normative dimension as well. And then I pledge for an analysis looking at specific uh, democratic functions like participation, representation, and governing, and asking how do these specific uh, democratic regimes fulfill, uh, fulfill these functions. I, uh, again, uh, this is, uh, I have done this for the 28 European member states, and these are the surveys from uh, the Eurobarometer surveys, and you see the great columns here. You see the great columns. These are uh, the uh, yes answers to the question, are you highly satisfied with the working of your uh, democracy, and you see from the 1970s onwards, you have what Pippa Norris probably would call trendless fluctuation. There is not a clear decline where we could say democracy is in crisis. I uh, want to uh, draw your attention uh, to a very specific line, just keep it in mind, uh, uh, you see the red line. This is, uh, Italy is underperforming in the, the eyes of the Italian citizens, but uh, from uh, the early 1990s up uh, to uh, the tw uh, 2003 and 2005, you have an increasing, steep increasing in satisfaction with the working of democracy in Italy. And you know who was governing at that time? It was our uh, uh, friend Berlusconi. If you ask the same question to experts, what we did with the democracy barometer where we used 100 indicators to measure the quality of democracy, you see the purple line. The experts are saying what we would expect. There is a clear decline of uh, democracy in Italy. So the question is who decides it? We experts or the demos? At least we have to take both things uh, into consideration and we can see uh, that quite, uh, or it can happen that there are clear divergent perception of the development of democracy. So this would be uh, the uh, uh, evaluation of the quality of democracy, the green line uh, you are seeing again from during the last 25 years, there's also no decline of the general quality of democracy of the 30 best democracies taken out from quality 4 and uh, Freedom House measurements. I want, uh, this is just a point I'm taking out where I'm, I am skeptical that we can talk about a crisis of democracy in general and this is to some extent supported to the mass surveys and the quality in disease, but I think uh, certain uh, institutions and especially representative institutions have trouble uh, and uh, therefore, probably uh, democracies as a whole will run into specific problems. If you look and divide institutions in majoritarian institutions, those institutions we are allowed to vote for, and non-majoritarian uh, institutions like military, police, 
judiciary, administration, uh, where we cannot vote for. And if we again ask uh, the citizens of the European member state, you see on the left side uh, that political parties are on the trust level of youth car dealers, around 20%, and then you have a um, visible decline of, which is even more problematic, of parliaments and governments, a visible and rather robust uh, uh, decline to the level of 30%. I do not talk now about that trust uh, is not always the best indicator for democracy, a critical citizen has to have distrust to those who govern as well. And this is quite important. But we are trusting those institutions where we cannot vote for, we distrust those we can vote for. So this is certainly a paradox uh, which uh, dom democracy is facing. I have, I, I come to two, two slides. So I jump to the conclusion. My problem with uh, these, uh, the talk on crisis of democracy is that holistic crisis of democracy cannot be uh, tested, uh, so we cannot falsify or verify. We can have some plausible arguments, but uh, for empirical researchers, this is certainly not enough. As we have seen, uh, if we check uh, the democracy indices, there are no crises of clear signs for a crisis of democracy, and this is supported by mass surveys as well. The threshold question, which is uh, quite important, has not been solved theoretically so far, and we do not have good theories how we deal with improvements and worsening of democracy. Last slide. Uh, there are trends behind this wheel of uh, seemingly trendless fluctuation. There's a shifting axis of democratic legitimacy from uh, majoritarian, I have to turn it around, from majoritarian to non-majoritarian institutions. And we, what we were talking about yesterday, what I consider uh, is a big problem of our democracy. They are, uh, have become two-thirds democracy. One-third simply does not take place, does not participate, is not sufficiently represented. And we are comfortably living to some extent, at least in Europe and uh, in the United States, up to the last uh, time at least, uh, with uh, this one-third completely excluded from a proper democratic participation. So I leave it with that, uh, and I hope it became somehow clear that we have to do still analytical uh, and theoretical work for developing an analytical concept of crisis and maybe it contributes that we are somehow more cautious when we are using the term in order to describe the state of democracy at present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Merkel. Well, now I'm turning the the works of the of the panel to Brigitte Zeithen. She's going to talk about crisis of democracy at the critical junctures. And um, Brigitte, or Brita, as we know uh, around here, uh, is chair of the Cathedral Marchus for German and European Studies since uh, 2015. She has been doing a wonderful job uh, here at the University of Sao Paulo. She's also invited professor for the political science department. And uh, he has been doing research in different fields, mainly in the intersection between international relations and cooperative politics, uh, which led her to focus on regional organizations and regional security, democratization, human rights, and transitional justice. So, Rita, please, feel free. 
Okay, let me try to handle all these things here. <laughs> um, what I would like to present today is um, something like um, an attempt to mitigate some of the problems that my colleague Wolfgang Merkel has just mentioned and to try to come up with something like a concept building exercise. Um, I'm not sure that it's um, really finished yet, you can judge for yourself. Um, but I think, I, 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 well, the, the, it, it's worthwhile doing the, uh, making an attempt. And um, just maybe briefly to comment in the, on your presentation, what you said about the threshold and the lack of a threshold. I think when we look at other political science concepts, and including ones from the field of democratization research, there are quite a lot of concepts that are widely accepted, but still it depends very much on the individual researchers how the thresholds are defined. I mean, think of transition, for instance. Do we have a universal definition when a transition starts, when a transition ends? I think it depends quite a lot on how the researcher that looks at that particular case or at the look that does a quantitative analysis defines this, actually. And what, if, what, what is the trigger point of a transition? What is the finishing point of a transition? When does a regime enter from a transition into the consolidation phase? Um, I think here we have more or less, facing more or less the same problems like with the concepts uh, with the concept of crisis. Anyway, starting with some images here of cases uh, that are widely perceived in the media and often in academic debate to represent crisis of democracy or challenges to democracy. Um, from Europe and Latin America, you see some examples of the populist leaders here on the upper right hand side. Um, we have um, the, uh, on the upper left hand side the, 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 the coup in Honduras in 2009 where the democratically elected president was ousted with the support of the military. We have the case of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro here below that, which is an ongoing situation. Um, then we have the situation of the impeachment of Fernando Lugo in Paraguay here on the lower left hand side which is also very contested and people don't have the same opinion of whether this was um, a formal constitutional uh, impeachment procedure or not. And the same, of course, the same debate for uh, the case of Dilma Rousseff and um, the impeachment in Brazil. So just to show you that there is a wide range of examples, and these are just a few selected ones that are currently discussed under this label of crisis of democracy. Um, and um, what I what I discovered when I when I did research principally or primarily on Latin America and later on also on the cases in Europe um, and crisis theories in Europe, some of which were already mentioned in the previous presentation, is that the concept of crisis varies a lot between the two regions. And if we look at different phases of research on crisis, we can quite clearly, clearly see that. For instance, in the 1970s, the theories that Wolfgang Merkel already mentioned in his presentation, um, that what he called the overload uh, thesis, or ungovernability thesis, or uh, the legitimation crisis of late capitalism, talking about the overload of the welfare state, talking about well, coming up with solutions such as cutting down, shutting down the welfare state, or arguing that exactly this will lead to problems, that it will lead to lack of uh, representation, that it will harm the established democratic actors such as political parties, such as trade unions, that were up to that point uh, making sure that societal integration and class struggle uh, did not erupt, societal integration was guaranteed, um, so these were the debates going on in the 1970s with regard to Europe and Latin America, and it made mainly conceptualized crisis as something latent, something that was dragging on, that um, was um, going on over a longer time period. At the same time in Latin America in the 1970s, um, theories of crisis mainly looked at crisis as a stage preceding the breakdown of democratic regimes. So the focus of the research was more on breakdown and crisis in works by Juan Lins, for, uh, for, for example, was considered to be a phase, a step towards breakdown, but not very clearly defined in its own right. Um, now, if we look at more recent research after 2000 in Europe and Latin America, we have a re 
surgeons of theories of prices of democracy, and I've mentioned a few here, a few labels that have been uh, created. And again, in the European and North American debate, mostly the idea of crisis is something like a slow decline, something like hollowing out from within uh, certain features of democracy. So again, we are facing uh, a concept, a latent concept of crisis. In turn, uh, in the literature on Latin America, mostly when scholars talk about democratic crisis or crisis of democracy, they usually refer to events that challenge democracy, such as, well, historically coups and coup attempts, or more recently, self-coups, out of all now when presidents acquire dictatorial power, um, confrontations um, between uh, the government and the opposition, between the government and the parliament, so inter-institutional clashes, if you want, uh, ousters of presidents by mass demonstrations. Um, so it's more like focusing on particular situations that lead to a change, either of the political regime or at least of the government. Um, and so again, we, have, we can see in the, in the European and North American context, mostly the debate is about latent crises, it's about situations that develop over a long time, longer time period, and in Latin America, and mostly the crisis concept refers to acute crisis, to short-term um, situations that might challenge democratic institutions. Now, if we approach this term of crisis, try to solve a bit this term of crisis from a, a definitional perspective, um, Reinhard, Reinhard Koselek wrote an article about the hist history of science of the term of crisis and comes up with several interpretative possibilities. Uh, crisis as a process concept, as a chain of events that culminate in a decision-making situation in which action is required. The ultimate decision concept, where crisis is a sudden radical upheaval that leads to profound changes. And the iterative period concept, if you want, crisis as recurring potential turning points in the course of time. So why I highlight this is because I think already these, several of these two of these variants already combine the possibility of having a latent development that then leads to some sort of point of escalation, or some develops to a point where the decision situation emerges. Um, and so this uh, suggests that it is not um, absolutely absurd to think about combining these two concepts, and to combine an, a, a latent concept of crisis with an acute concept of crisis, and to frame actual events in these terms. Now, the definition, therefore, that I propose would, for crisis of democracy in particular, would be to, to conceptualize crisis of democracy as serious systemic disturbances of the democratic order, um, which endangers really its normative core. Um, so it's not if we have mass protests about particular policies, that would not be a crisis of democracy. But if democracy itself is challenged, um, and this includes even um, undemocratic or semi-democratic ways of ousting an elected president, of course. Um, so, um, so the scope of, of this is if the significance of democracy and the functioning of democratic institutions themselves are questioned or are challenged, when this is at stake, really. Um, the severity that there is actually that the changes or what, what is going on is potentially substance changing or life threatening for democracy. Um, strategies could vary, of course, we have more ambiguous situations where uh, actors bend rather than break norms, and then more clear-cut situations where clearly democratic norms are violated. Um, the origin, there could be several different types of actors involved, either within the regime itself, democratically legitimized actors, or exogenous actors, meaning extra-institutional, non-democratically legitimized actors. Um, and again, the timing could be incremental or sudden. Um, so, um, one way what, that I thought about this is actually uh, this would need to have a question mark <laughs> to think about crisis as critical junctures. So, if, especially if you think about acute crisis of situations that escalate, that uh, demand a decision, we can frame, we could fr think of crisis as something like a critical juncture as conceptualized by historical institutionalism, something like a turning point, um, a phase of institutional uncertainty, of institutional flux, um, 
during which substantial change is possible and one institutional path may be, ab may be abandoned in favor of another one. Um, yeah, so this is the idea that the crisis can actually influence, can impact on the democratic institutional um, architecture, if you want. Of course, the outcome is more open. I mean, there is a debate both in the research or both in debates on critical junctures as well as in crisis theories, whether the definition of crisis automatically requires a substantive change to take place. And there is no consensus on this. And I would say it's not necessarily the case. So it, you could have a crisis followed by re-equilibration, as uh, Juan Linz has called it. So crisis can also kind of lead to re-stabilization of the regime. It does not necessarily have to lead to a substantial change of the regime. So in terms of the outcome, crisis may result in substantive change, but may also may result in continuity. Um, another element that I'm not going to talk very much about in this presentation is causes of crisis. And um, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish different variants of crisis from their causes. When we look at crisis theories, they emphasize factors such as globalization, um, such as um, weak rule of law, institutional factors, where we often again, must ask ourselves, so is that actually a cause or is that already the crisis? So I think here we also need to, need to um, um, reflect more on what is the crisis itself and what are its causes. Or, well, Larry Diamond actually gave a presentation here a few months ago. Uh, I asked him the same questions because I thought he kind of confounded these factors in his presentation. And he said, well, it's actually not possible to make this clear distinction to really come up with a very clear definition of what is independent variable and what is uh, dependent variable here. Um, anyway, I leave that open for discussion for the moment because it's not the main focus of the presentation. Now, um, let's do a little bit of um, concept building let's, and, and uh, following um, the suggestions of Gary Gertz and others on, on concept building and social sciences, you can reflect on concepts by mapping the semantic fields that they are, which, which they find themselves in. So, which terms are related but distinct from the term of interest. Uh, we can also go about this by defining so-called negative poles, so trying to define what the concept of interest is not, or what are the opposites of it. Um, and um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's uh, look at crisis and, and related terms first. Um, so when we, when we think about um, about uh, crisis as acute, as events, as kind of potentially challenging events, then crises are conceptualized in the timeline as events that potentially can change the course um, of um, the institutional development. And often we have seen that crises were um, at the point, at the uh, kind of turning points that led to either democratic transitions uh, or that also well led to or influenced or occurred in the course of democratic consolidation, uh, or that led to democratic breakdown. So this is just to depict that a little bit. Crisis as events, as impacts. So this would be more close to this uh, understanding of acute crisis. Now, we can also think about crisis influencing democratic consolidation in the way of um, where scholars probably would say it's a latent crisis that undermines or that blocks or hinders democratic consolidation. And in that sense, then crisis would impact on the level of democracy and would uh, may, may change the level of democracy if we think about it in terms of measuring democracy. Um, so in, it could improve democracy, but it also could worsen democracy. So often we have cases where a crisis challenged democracy and then afterwards um, measures were taken to improve democracy in the countries. So um, this is another possibility. And the third, of course, uh, possibility would be to look at related or at, at subtypes of crisis, so to say, or variants of crisis. And I just list a few of them, um, such as uh, military coups, autogolpes, constitutional crisis, political conflicts, electoral fraud, irregular government change. So all of them um, often are defined as crisis and would amount to a situation where democratic norms are challenged. 
Now, when we think about the negative poles, we could say that, um, as I showed before, a crisis can undermine or challenge um, consolidation when it is a latent crisis that drags on for a longer time period. Obviously, it runs counter to democratic consolidation. But when we think about crisis more as events that have an immediate impact, it challenges stability. So we can distinguish crisis from both of these concepts and say, okay, we have latent crisis or acute crisis, both of which would fulfill the definition of crisis, and both of them would challenge um, these negative poles, either consolidation or stability. And then when we think about how to operationalize that, what could be potential indicators, I think both with respect to latent crisis and with respect to acute crisis, we could make a distinction um, between either the government being the key actor and violating democratic norms, and there are many cases of democratically elected government that then undermine democracy, or it could be endogenous actors, democratically legitimized actors, parts of the institutions that challenge the government, so sort of an illoyal opposition within the parliament um, that question um, mechanisms of democracy. Um, or we can have external actors, external mean, meaning not democratically legitimized actors, that question democratic norms. Um, and these three types can be identified both for latent crisis and for acute crisis. And of course these are very general indicators, but you can easily think about well, how to, how to, how to uh, study them. For instance, of course, if we have questioning of democratic norms, uh, it was already mentioned, we could look at what the population says, we could also look at what experts say. Now, as I don't have much time left, I think let's move on. Um, because what I would have argued before is that often latent and acute crises occur hand in hand. They are often connected. Often an acute crisis is the starting point that then leads to a latent decline of democracy over a long time period. Um, we also find the other example that the latent crisis has been developing over a certain time period and then all of a sudden ends or um, culminates in, a, in, a, in an acute crisis. Um, and um, then we also have cases where there is a long-running latent crisis and then several points of culmination. Um, well, thinking about examples, when we think about the case of Venezuela currently, for instance, uh, for a long time there has been a talk about a crisis, about a decline of democracy, and now more recently we can identify certain points where really substantive institutional changes have taken place, and this could then be conceptualized as acute crisis within a longer-running latent crisis. But there are also crises where they run at the same time without being connected, so where different um, aspects of democracies are being set challenged, say there have been constitutional changes on the one hand that have been going on for latently for a longer time period, and then all of a sudden there is a threat, there is a military mutiny or something like that, um, that has nothing to do with the origin of, of the constitutional change, and then they occur like in the example D in parallel without being causally related. Okay. So just very briefly, another possibility is to, to uh, identify certain types of crises. Uh, most of these differentiations are already mentioned before, so we can distinguish among, according to the origin of challenge, whether it's intra-institutional, either from the government or from other elected democratically legitimized institutions, or whether it's extra-institutional, coming from actors that do not have democratic legitimacy, we can distinguish crises according to their strategy, norm-breaking or norm-bending, leading to clear-cut versus more ambiguous crisis situations. Um, I skipped that for the moment because it's just a taxonomy that we, that we used for uh, the previous book. We can also look at actually which dimensions of democracy are affected uh, by these changes, and Wolfgang Merkel mentioned that uh, point already. Or we can distinguish them according to the outcome. So the question whether the crisis led to re-equilibration, to a change in government, to a change in the democratic regime as such, or to regime breakdown. Um, and just to conclude, what is the aim of all of this? That might seem, as I didn't have much enough time to go into concrete examples, it might seem very abstract. 
But just to summarize, uh, the attempt is to come up with a new uniform framework for debates on crisis of democracy in Europe, Latin America, and potentially also in other regions. Uh, to distinguish the phenomenon from related but distinct terms. So I think one tricky issue is, for instance, to distinguish crisis from actual decline of democracy, because often we say we talk about crisis in terms of, or we say crisis when we actually mean decline of democracy. And I would argue that actually what the crisis is actually the situation that creates the conditions where then later on the decline is the effect. Um, and so... I think it's, it's, it's important to make that clear, to uh, distinguish crisis from related terms. Uh, also to distinguish crisis from their causes and their outcomes. So once we have a more clear idea what a crisis is, we can start coming up with causal theories of what are potential causes and what are potential consequences of crisis. Um, the taxonomies that I quickly presented at the end uh, allow us to, to identify different types of crisis or also different dynamics of crisis regarding this going hand in hand or not of acute and latent crisis. Uh, this also enables us to identify trends. For instance, in the case of Latin America, we saw that um, 20, 30 years ago, we usually have clear-cut crisis, military coups, military threats, and now this has changed a lot to more ambiguous types of crisis. And coming up with taxonomies like that helps us to trace these developments over time. And hopefully also can help us to enable interregional comparisons um, to make clearer what we are talking about. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, Britta. I think we already have some interesting ideas for the debate here. Uh, Rita even posed some uh, ideas to be uh, deal with by Professor Merkel, uh, but maybe we can open the world to the floor just to have some extra insights for the debate, and then we give back what we have got to our panelists. So, Professor Mayer, please, and you can begin. Thank you. Thank you both for the very interesting presentation. Uh, for both of them, I would like you to, um, uh, to elaborate a little bit more about the last line of your conclusions, that is to say bad news, because uh, it seemed very interesting that you didn't have the time to, uh, to talk about this. And, and for Brita, I wonder if this idea of crisis as as a um, critical juncture applies much more uh, to acute crisis than to what you both uh, said about latent, uh, latent crisis. Because uh, junctures, both they go either way or another, and in that case, you must specify, specify the alternative, the alternative pathways. But in, when you talk about erosion, uh, okay, that, I can't, I cannot see this as a junction. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be talking about uh, Turkey as an acute uh, crisis uh, later today, so this is a great framework to open up with. But I, I would like to ask a question and, and ask you to comment a little bit about this, both of you actually, about this notion of decline. Um, the traditional history uh, understanding of the Ottoman Empire says that the Ottoman Empire was in decline for 250 years. Edward Gibbon said that the Roman Empire was in decline for 1,500 years, at least 300 years in the West. And from the perspective of normativity, from the scholar's perspective, isn't, is, is there any way to go beyond this subjective notion of decline? Or isn't there a way to actually also think about it from the perspective of, well, our standards are rising and be seen as a way of actually improving um, our democracies because if we're unhappy with what we have today, which perhaps we didn't have yesterday, 
Um, we want to improve certain things more. I mean, I'm not proposing a teleological or opposite tele teleology. How do we overcome this sort of perpetual decline um, theory from the sort of scholarly perspective? First of all, I, I applaud the strategy of, of disaggregating these very general diagnoses of decline as much as possible, getting us away from this very simplistic Freedom House style approach of, you know, the market for democracy is up or the market for democracy is down. But I wanted to also ask about one aspect that, as far as I could tell, neither of you mentioned, but that will be often mentioned in sort of more journalistic accounts in crisis today. And that is changes in the conditions of political world formation. Or put less abstractly, changes in the public sphere. In some cases, of course, when you think about, let's say, newspapers, it really is a crisis in the traditional sense. Newspapers are dying, disappearing completely. Do you think this is overrated? Uh, do you think we only sort of see this as a, as a as part of the crisis because we idealize the past, or it shouldn't really figure into the sort of discussion? Thank you. And the last question, please. Uh, well, hello, uh, I am Antonio, I'm recently, well, I'm undertaking my, my master's degree studies here at the University specific at the DCP on the Department of Political Science. And first of all, thank you, Brit and Professor Merco, for your, for, for sharing your, your ideas. But actually, my, my question has to do more specifically with something uh, you, uh, uh, Professor Merco, mentioned yesterday. And I, I couldn't properly at the moment elaborate my question, but I will, I will see the opportunity to, to ask you now. It has to do more specifically with your ideas on co cosmopolitanism and communitarianism, which I found very interesting. And still, it, it has to do with what you mentioned regarding uh, cultural assimilation, which I found uh, interesting that uh, cosmopolitanism, in terms, is more multicultural, and would this favor, for instance, uh, an approach of, of cultural assimilation, whereas communitarianism would favor a more distinctive cultural choice, for instance. So my, my question has to do with uh, the relationship between com uh, cosmopolitanism and nationalism. And I'm here understanding nationalism not necessarily as a xenophobic uh, construction, but more, more properly as a, simply a cultural community, a sense of belonging which goes towards a, a, a national project, for instance. So my question is, uh, what's the relationship between cosmopolitanism and nationalism? Are they mutually exclusive? Um, and how to properly frame the issues of representation? Uh, what I mean by that is, for instance, What's the degree by which a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan uh, policy, for instance, will, will favor representation of minority, which later on could actually end up questioning this very same cosmopolitan order, by a sense, for instance, a more strictly nationalist approach? And, well, if you could uh, please elaborate, it would be very useful uh, to me. And, uh, well, this actually has to do with the, with the question here in, in terms of uh, regime stability and democratic decline, if we consider from, from the optics of, of representation and granting of rights. So, thank you, Nandu Benson. Thank you. So, I think, Britta, we can do a division of labor uh, and it's a very difficult question. You can answer that, and I pick up the easy question at the beginning. Uh, Angelina, uh, bad news, what I meant, uh, bad news. If we come to the conclusion that poor institutions of democracy <coughs> under particular pressure of losing trust among citizens, then we can think about are there other institutions, procedures, and actors which can, so to say, uh, uh, 
take over the functions of these uh, uh, core institutions, meaning part in participation, in representation, and even in decision making. And then we have this wonderful democratic innovation, sometimes even referenda, which are not a real innovation. Uh, we can, can be dated back 2,000 years and more. Uh, but we have uh, citizen councils, we have participatory budgeting, uh, we have all the mini publics, uh, Fishkin and the tradition of Jürgen Habermas and so forth. I think these are uh, innovation which can complement to some extent the core institutions. But I have problems to understand beyond referenda how they can be rolled out on a national level. They may be very good on um, uh, a municipal level, but I have tremendous problems uh, if it comes to core policy making. Let's talk about fiscal policy. Let's talk about the social policy. You need national regulation. You need highly uh, legitimate actors uh, to come to decisions. So my, uh, my skeptical point of view is first, uh, you cannot roll it out really to a national, uh, at a national level. It is unresolved what is the specific relation of the decision-making bodies of representative institutions on the one side and these participatory institutions on the other side. Is there a hierarchy of democratic legitimacy? As constitutionalists would argue, would say if one body has a higher, higher uh, is ranking higher in democratic legitimacy, should make the decision. The second point, this is maybe very much on European point of view. Uh, Tami Pokrytinsky, my uh, collaborator and colleague at uh, the WZB, is reminding me uh, that. My argument, you have an even higher social selectivity in democratic in, uh, innovation does not apply very much to Latin America. In Europe, you see clearly it's only the educated, uh, uh, the, uh, sometimes the young and the retired people who are engaging. And it's a small circle of people who are doing it. And if we come to the conclusion that the representative institutions are uh, not uh, solving the question of political inequality, it may be an acceleration of the democratic disease and not the solution. This is my skeptical point of view, but I see some uh, 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 applications uh, on the municipal level However, in core policies of the national level, I cannot uh, see it. Uh, just a, a brief, we can do it, uh, or you can do the second one, and I do the third one, so I'm not talking too long. You mean the second question, I mean, was uh, directed to me, generally, to, by, by Maria Emilia on the crisis and the critical junctures, uh, whether it's possible to conceptualize them as critical junctures. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, it, I, even in, I think even in cases of what we could call latent crisis, I think they are, we can identify certain points, certain decision points or turning points. So that would be one possibility to really focus on these situations where actually the decision is made to abandon a certain democratic norm or to undermine it um, and to identify these points and to talk about these points as crisis. That's one possibility. Another possibility, of course, would be to say, okay, we don't, <clears throat> we just abandon these, well, we, we abandon this distinction between latent and, uh, and um, uh, acute crisis and focus more actually on the indicators and there we see a lot of similarities here between acute and latent crisis. We can see that they have the same origin, we can see the same strategies, um, we can see the parallels, and we can, um, of course, it, ne it needs further reflection to think about the indicators of how to identify the crisis. But then I think um, it's, it's pretty much, well, it's, it's either undemocratic or behavior or 
behavior by the government questioning democratic norms, it's, well, inter-institutional uh, confrontations, or it's a threat coming from outside democratically legitimated institutions. And this applies, I think, both to acute and latent crisis. So maybe it's not so important to, to really make this distinction, but rather to think about uh, the requisites of crisis. Um, do you want to continue now, or how are we doing this <laughs> with the next question? I can, I can do it. Uh, the, sorry, I did not get your name, my Turkish colleague. Karen. Karen. Karen, easier to call I don't repeat it for the moment. I, I did some exercises during lunch. Uh, uh, decline. Uh, how can we uh, evaluate the decline of a political regime beyond sub subjective evaluations? What we are trying to do now for 20 years or Freedom House even more for, uh, for decades is measuring the quality of democracy. I don't go into detail how good we are. Uh, but in principle, I do think we can measure uh, the quality of democracy. I'm highly skeptical that at the end there should be one aggregate uh, index. This is always problematic because it washes away all these different developments I'm talking about, that you have simultaneous developments. Some are uh, leading to a decline of the quality and some them are improving it. So we can look over time and as an empirical researcher you, uh, you are enjoying these time series always and uh, as bad as these figures sometimes are, if you have a time series then you use these figures. Uh, this is the success probably of of Freedom House, but now we have other uh, varieties of uh, democracy measurement from Scandinavia, which probably will dominate the scene. So can look for year for year, is there a decline? Uh, and if these uh, indicators are valid to measure the quality, then you may not uh, be able to do it for two centuries, but even polity and others are trying to do it. For uh, since nineteen uh, since eighteen hundred, so there are measurements. Uh, we have to check how good these measurements are. But I think this is something where we do not have to rely simply on individual uh, uh, judgments. We have indicators we can check, and therefore we can understand whether there is a decline of quality or an improvement. Uh, can I say one word, Britta, uh, 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 to your uh, uh, presentation? The concept building, I think I'm very much in favor uh, to it, to, const uh, to construct in a way a conceptual tree. But I see a tremendous problem which I don't see solved in your concept building as well. On the one uh, uh, on the left side, we have crisis of democracy. The second column is dimensions. And then you are not using democracy, you are using for the dimensions crisis. But you have two concepts at the beginning. So then all of a sudden uh, democracy disappears and you have only latent and acute. So you are talking about the second term. And then if it comes to the indicators, you are back in uh, the indicators for democracy. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, elaborate your indicators out of your two dimensions. Will you see what, the, what I mean? So I think this is a problem if you do concept building and you have two concepts. Yeah, I, th I think we have not yet answered all the questions. <laughs> um, so let me just uh, try to continue with this and we can discuss this later also <laughs> because um, we are a bit al already behind schedule. So just very briefly on uh, Jan Werner Müller's question on the changes uh, in the public sphere. Yes, I agree that this is a big issue, especially when we think about the quality of elections, if you want, because of course the public opinion 
formation, the public will formation, um, is very much dependent on the media and what is represented in the media, which topics make it to the headlines, etc. Um, so yes, this is something I think that is that is going on. It's an ongoing process, and um, I think that um, uh, research, uh, the democratization, empirical democratization research, still has to grapple with this question. Yeah, how to how to how to capture this and this shift, this decline of major formerly influential media and at the same time the rise of blogs and uh, private contributions to the internet where all kinds of people can make a substantive contribution to public opinion. Um, it's something that, um, um, yeah, a phenomenon that can have a huge impact on elections. And I think so far indices of quality of democracy or quality of elections do not yet capture this. So uh, it's a point that needs to be taken into account. Um, and I think the last question was directed to you specifically. Uh, one word, Jan Werner, to your public sphere. Um, not sure whether you have in mind what Habermas has written uh, to the structural change of the public spheres in the early 19th. 60s, but if we look now from, uh, if we look to the uh, public sphere, the decisive difference, according to my point of view, is that you have a pluralization and a fragmentation of it. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is bad news, completely bad news for democracy before. You had much more controlled media, for example. Uh, less pluralization, and uh, those who were owning this media always made politics with them. And I do not share this optimism, now we have an anarchic uh, uh, arena of free uh, public opinion formation, uh, and we all see how problematic it is if the political discourses are not open, as Habermas and even John Stuart Mill would expect and uh, ask for. So this kind of anonymity or semi-anonymity probably brings out our worst uh, 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 sides of our character, and this again feeds hate speeches and, and so forth. However, I'm not a specialist, so I should be silent on it. Uh, yeah, I have not seen very good analysis so far what it means uh, for a democracy. In the 1990s, you had an overload of optimism. Now uh, we are uh, circumventing these monopolies of the media by democratic media. Now we are only talking about echo chambers and, and hate speeches. Uh, so the cosmopolitan, very sh uh, it's a long story, and I, I, I will be very brief. One of the differences I see between cosmopolitans who are uh, eager to transcend the borders of the nation state. So the subject they are addressing, their uh, uh, ideas, is not the citizen of the nation state, but is the global citizen. And therefore, they are asking, we have to open the borders for refugee and asylum seekers because these are citizens. This is certainly an extreme position of uh, uh, pinpointing and cosmopolitanism. And cosmopolitans are not only for opening borders, they are satisfied with a liberal and free society. Communitarians have the idea the society should be a community, a rather as homogeneous, not necessarily in ethnical terms, but in political terms, in terms of solidarity. So uh, on the one side, the classical communitarians, by the way, are not hinting at the nation state, but they are very much on uh, smaller units, uh, on municipalities and uh, at the communal level. Uh, what I uh, we were talking, what we were talking about yesterday, these uh, right wing populists, they are taking up some of these communitarian thinking, <laughs> and therefore I call them nationalist communitarians. They are certainly quite different uh, 
different ideas about what communitarianism mean and they are using it and ethnicizing it. Uh, the community has to be an ethnically rather homogeneous com community and to some extent now they are discovering the social dimension as well because they are discovering it is especially in the lower half of the society or the lower third of the society who overwhelmingly uh, opt and vote for these parties. Very last point, because it's so provoking, uh, the assimilation and multiculturalism question. And in Germany, you are not allowed to talk so openly. I'm here in a foreign country, and I dare to do it. Uh, so uh, from a normative point of view, I think uh, assimilation is something which uh, is not, uh, cannot be uh, in our political arsenal, among our political instruments. There are rights for cultural identity. On the other side is, we know from, again, from John Stuart Mill uh, through Robert Dahl and others, the more heterogeneous a society is, the less trust you will find. This is what Robert Putnam and others again and again and again we're checking by empirical results. And this is bad news because we will be a heterogeneous society. Heterogeneity is not only an ethnical one, it can be a class-based one as well. And uh, probably class is even worse. And you see it in Latin America, how you have to secure, or in uh, South Africa, this, these are the emblematic cases where you have to secure each property uh, very closely and in Denmark still you can leave your bicycle uh, somewhere unlocked and your car open. So uh, it is, it comes with a price and if you want to open it, uh, uh, then you will probably have a more uh, you will certainly have a more heterogeneous society and if you take Denmark, by the way, Denmark is always performing best in all these democracy indices, they are rather rigid in closing borders. Sweden is not. Uh, so uh, they want to close it and they have a, a highly solidaristic community uh, installed in this country. So there are trade-offs involved. I don't think even I'm in favor of this kind of multiculturalism. However, we have to be clear and we have to decide how we all want to pay, uh, to pay the price for it. And normally the price is paid by the lower strata and not by the higher strata if you open borders. Well, I'm afraid we don't have time for another round of questions. We are already behind the schedule, so let me thank you all of you for your questions. And as of all, let me thank Professor Merkel and Lisa for your presentation. Thank you very much. So, we will restart. And um, since we are uh, short of time, I will cut the presentations. They are uh, not very necessary uh, because we all know who is talking, otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? So we have Maria Nina and uh, Jose Alvaro Moises, the two of professors here from the political science department, who are very well known by, by the workers, works. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, family, family, non all over the world. Okay, so uh, without further delay, we will start with the first example. My Ermina goes first. Okay, so you have 20 minutes. Okay, okay. Well, after such an uh, interesting and, well, theoretical discussion of the first part, we are going down <laughs> to, <laughs> to the ground. Uh, actually, I must explain why I'm here. Uh, 
because uh, I'm not discussing the crisis of democracy. Uh, being a uh, political science in Brazil, it's quite impossible not to try to make sense what, uh, about what is happening here since 2013. Uh, I think it's not a crisis of democracy, but it's a huge political crisis that can tell us something about democracy in Brazil. Uh, I'm not discussing the crisis as such, uh, I, I choose to look at, uh, to look at the, uh, the crisis from the, uh, what was happening in society. Not in the political system, not in the parties, not with the main actors uh, of, of, of this process. And anyway, uh, what I try to, to do is illuminating some aspects of the, 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 the political crisis we, we, we are living in, looking towards society. And I have tried to do so looking at two different dimensions or perspectives. Society as civil society, that is to say the realm of autonomous organized groups, and society as mass public. Uh, an aggregate of individuals, citizens, with values and attitudes towards the political system. Uh, in the paper, therefore, I'm, I focus on the street mobilizations during the crisis and evolution of public opinion regarding the government, uh, especially regarding the former government of President Rousseff and the political institutions. Uh, what I argue is that street mobilization have revealed, no, uh, revealed new forms of civil society expression. It is that street mobilization, although uh, was were not the only element of the uh, of the process, uh, influenced a lot the public opinion evaluation of the government, of course the previous government, the Rousseff government, in different ways and its trends along this, uh, the, this period. And third, I argue that rapid and dramatic erosion of support for government that, after all, promoted huge social inclusion may be explained, one, by how people explain their own social and economic improvement, and then uh, on also on the underlying deeply rooted attitudes regarding political institutions. Uh, in the course of uh, writing the, the, the paper, I have tried to bring together two academic fields that do not dialogue too much. On one hand, the studies of social movements, and on the other hand, the, the field that deals with values and attitudes of the mass public. From the studies on social movements, I have borrowed the idea of Roggenband and the Laportas, of light communities, uh, characterized by light identities, loose ties, short-term engagement, and low political identification. <clears throat> and from the literature about public opinion, I borrow from uh, Klingemann's and Dalton's idea of the dissatisfied Democrats, characterized by support for democracy and mistrust and disaffection toward democratic representative institutions. Uh, the story is seen from the streets. Uh, there is no doubt that the point of departure of our story is June 2013, when thousands of people went to the streets, although at that time different alternative outcomes were possible to the present crisis. In the streets emerge a new civil society of like communities. Uh, Dave Greenberg uh, wrote a piece in New York Review of Books called Inside Zuccotti Park, sometime at the, the, at the time of Occupy Wall Street movement. And uh, he said that Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, movement uh, had a uh, uh, general lemma that was so vague that he offered a blank screen where everybody could project its own aspirations. I think the movement of 2013 is like that. People, lots of people in the street, different demands, different 
with no organization, no participation of parties, no participation of unions, no participation of organ old organized uh, civil society. <clears throat> After 2013, uh, from March 2015 to April 2016, there has been two of the huge national anti-government rallies and two huge pro-government mobilizations. They all had approximately the same characteristics uh, and the same social basis. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the major uh, rallies in the, since 2000, in 2015 to 2016, and as we can see, there is a Slide, yeah. Of, of the um, strata that uh, that mobilized the forms of, of of participation, the nature of the groups were very different. As uh, I would argue, uh, the the 2013 uh, rally and all the others in the, against the government, against the. the Workers' Party government, well, full of, uh, well, organized by what I call light communities, that is to say, small groups, uh, not related to political parties, not related to, uh, to unions and so forth, while the base of the pro government uh, rallies were the previous social, uh, the traditional. Uh, uh, so, uh, civil society of unions, of the uh, students' organizations, of the party from, uh, from the government. Uh, one of the, 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 the movements had an important impact on the approval of, of uh, <laughs> President Rousseff's uh, government and evaluation. Uh, the two black lines at uh, the moment of the June 13 uh, <coughs> rally, uh, rallies and uh, uh, May, uh, March uh, 15. As you can say, um, the, the approval to the government, which was very high one month before June to, uh, 2013, went down. Had a little, hmm, uh, a little uh, improve, and then began to 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 come down even before uh, the uh, the the first um, first huge uh, movement against the government in 2015. Uh, and one of, one of the questions is since. Uh, the base of the movements were groups of mid-income mid strata. Much of them have benefited a lot from the, the policies of, uh, of government. Why they went to, 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 to the streets and how to, uh, to explain it? Here are the data on the improvements that, that show important improvements in a lot of people, especially of the poor. Uh, this is the index of minimum wage uh, for Brazil. Uh, for and the the blue is emerging markets. Uh, the the red is Latin American and Caribbean, and uh, and the green is Brazil. Okay. And this is the the index, uh, Gini index also for Brazil, uh, for Latin America, and for em emerging markets. So there's no doubt that this period of the Workers' Party government brought uh, improvement in a lot of us, a lot of people, and the emergency of middle groups in, in, in inside society. I had another table better than that. Uh, we have run a survey with these groups of middle income and asked them what, uh, what the cause, if they have improved the, the situation. In case of the improvement of the situations, what were the explanations uh, for, for getting better or for getting worse? Those who said uh, that their situations have improved 
they attribute their for their own effort to the family and to God. <laughs> why? When they explain the, the, uh, why the, their situation is worse than it used to be, the government is the, uh, the, the main, uh, main response, the president is the main responsible. responsible. Uh, the, uh, the economic crisis is the second, the governor is the third, the mayor is the third, and I myself maybe a little bit. Uh, so, uh, the interpretation of the, uh, of the facts are hard facts also. They move people and they, uh, and they explain uh, the, the behavior of, of people. I think that besides uh, the contingent evaluation of governments uh, that depend on um, present issues, on discussions on what is going on. on the, I think that uh, uh, this contingent evaluation is framed, in case of Brazil, by deep-rooted perceptions and attitudes uh, regarding representative institutions, since they predispose the citizens to accept negative information about the government. Politicians, including presidents, lie and cannot be trusted. I think that these are the, the underground feelings of the, of, the, of the people. They are much more prone to be critical. And that's why I said we have a, a democracy with unsatisfied, or dissatisfied critical seats and increasing critical seats. Um, so I'll show you some data also about this. This is data about, uh, this is data from World Value Survey. Uh, Brazil is yellow, uh, <clears throat> Europe is blue, uh, all democracies is um, purple, <clears throat> and uh, Central Europe is green. And you see, Brazil is not so bad, not so different from, from other, uh, other, the trend at least, not so, so different, quite on the contrary, in the case of Brazil, we have a, a process of upward in the, in the 2000s and then going down to uh, regarding the, the confidence in government. When we look to confidence in Parliament, there is in the middle of this, uh, of this, of, of those groups, not different, not all different from Latin America, uh, not the, not the Brazil is yellow, huh? not that difference from, from, from Central America, of course a little bit different of uh, South Europe. Confidence in Parliament is here. Sweden, Uruguay, Germany, Spain, Argentina, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Poland, and Peru. <coughs> Confidence in political parties is very low, and is low wherever. Not that, yeah, wherever, <coughs> in other places. <coughs> Brazil is not so that different from Spain, it's above Poland, and this is confidence in the justice system. Once more, all democracies are uh, uh, in purple, blue is South Europe, uh, green is Central Europe, um, red is, is Latin America and uh, Brazil is yellow. Mm -hmm. So we have a pattern here that doesn't differ too much from other parts of, of, of the world, and this seems to be the ground beneath, uh, beneath which uh, the perceptions of, of, of what uh, was going on during the the, the process of, of, of crisis uh, occur in Brazil. Uh, I would conclude uh, 
saying that massive mobilization echoed and activated the mood of a public made of dissatisfied uh, citizens that are predisposed to evaluate negatively uh, the uh, political institutions and the government, and that the content and support or rejections of a particular president or other public authorities is framed in a deep and enduring disaffection uh, towards political institutions typical of contemporary democratic publics. What this means regarding to the, the future the stability of, of, of democracy is another, uh, is another discussion. I think that this, this data <clears throat> and what happened here uh, maybe make us more uh, more similar to countries where untrustful uh, citizens uh, may act as uh, as a positive uh, uh, may have a, a positive effect in the in the functioning of democracy as long as you have in the political system the capacity to uh, to to proceed to process to process. Uh, to process the sentiment, and as long as you have a political system that is quite open uh, to incorporate some of this, uh, uh, this this content and translated it into uh, political action and political uh, agendas, uh, there are. That is why I said I'm not talking about the uh, crisis of democracy in Brazil. I'm not, we don't know what the future of this crisis will be, but I'm modest, moderately optimistic regarding of the emergence of a society that can mobilize, uh, that's a, that's a society can, that can express itself, and that uh, the existence of citizens that have, that have uh, reason to be un untrustful and unsatisfied regarding the political institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make my presentation in English, but I prefer to read it in order to be more clear and not to commit uh, many mistakes that I could do. Um, in, in a sense, that I will make a sort of very specific presentation uh, going in the direction to try to describe the Brazilian crimes and at the same time to interpret in some sense uh, what I think is the case. Uh, uh, also, in relation to the debates that we have this morning, I would say that I'm going in the direction of what Brita has defined as a, a critical juncture. I think that the, we, that's why we are facing now in Brazil. But I would say that uh, uh, also, that we be, uh, be more specific about the interpretation, we are among the sort of... Uh, uh, um, potential and acute to a kind of cross. Brazil has been facing since 2014 its most serious crisis after its democratization in the, in the 1980s. I think this is the most severe crisis faced by the country in more than 120 years of Republican regime. Main challenges arising from it refer to issues that impact the quality of the Brazilian democracy. The crisis is multidimensional, affecting the economy, politics, the society system of values, and these dimensions feedback to others. Its most evident aspect was the incapacity of the government elected in 2014 to coordinate its Congress base and ensure governability. And this, in association with serious accusations of abuse of power, led to the second impeachment of a democratically elected president in less than, than 25 years. 
The crisis points also to structural and permanent dysfunctions of the political system, particularly the crisis of political representation, of non-consolidation, entirely consolidation of the party system, and of the unstable functioning of the so-called coalition of presidentialism. I refer briefly to those dimensions in the following. Brazil has been immersed in a deep economic recession since the second half of 2014, which made more than 1.8 million companies of different lines of business, industry, commerce, service, agribusiness, to, to close down since 2014. And this led the country to very serious social consequences, as the increase of unemployment, the drop in the income of those employed, and the growth of inflation affecting particularly segments of the, of the base of the social pyramid. As regards to the political realm, the executive, legislature, and judiciary continue to work, but signs of growing conflict among them are threatening the political stability, and there are disputable constitutional provisions to deal with such institutional crisis. Besides, the political system has evident difficulties to respond with the promptness and the efficacy required by the systemic challenges of its functioning, whose persistence worsens the economic crisis and its social effects. In this regard, the political repairing effects, although politically destabilizing of the car wash operation, which investigates, charges, processes, and punishes crimes of corruption committed by political leaders, state bureaucrats, and corporate officers in recent decades, as well as the crisis that hit the National Congress in 2015 and 2016, involving charges against the speakers of the Chamber of Deputies and of the Federal Senate, making the former to be removed from office and then imprisoned, and leading to more than 15 files for investigation of the latter, in addition to his removal from the presidential line of succession by the Supreme Federal Court are clear signs of the seriousness of the situation. The crisis also affects society system of values, as revealed by the car wash operation, showing the abandonment by most political actors of fundamental values of democracy, like the respect for the rule of law, the equality in electoral competition, and the prevalence of public interest over the, public, the, the private ones. External effects to, of the, to the functioning of democratic institutions appear in the perception of the Brazilian citizens about the state of politics. As revealed by opinion polls which I have conducted in 2006 and 2014, more than 94 of Brazilians do not feel represented by any political party. In 2016, 95 of the respondents said that they believe that Brazil is, is facing a crisis of perspective. And in addition to the majority saying corruption is the most serious issue suffered by the country, 92 consider that all or almost all the politicians are dishonest, while 89% are incapable of mentioning polit <coughs> a politician with conditions to face the crisis. Data suggests that citizens do not identify <clears throat> citizens do not identify among actors of the political scene scenario anyone capable to fight the present challenge. In the case of political parts, the distrust increases from 80% in 2006 to more than 85% in 2014. And in the case of the Congress, from 72 to, to over 76. The satisfaction with the political system had already been seen in demonstrations, as Arminia has been mentioned in, in her presentation, in 2013, when more than 2 million people are estimated to have gathered on the streets. Those results suggest that for some social segments of Brazilian democracy, of the Brazilian, Brazilian democracy is under strong scrutiny in the country. In the following, I refer to those issues in order to evaluate its impacts in the quality of the Brazilian democracy, particularly in relation to the concepts of accountability and responsiveness. I first present a summary 
of the democratization process and then move into very brief reference to issues concerning the relations of the executive and the legislature in the context of the coalition of presidentialism and the difficulties for the consolidation of the past system. Brazil is a young democracy, having not yet completed 30 years of its current democratic experiment, but one of the largest electoral democracies in the world, behind on India, the United States and Russia, with nearly 145 million voters out of more than 205 million inhabitants. Election cycles for choosing governments have been occurring since 1989, according to the Constitution, generally free of frauds and ensuring alternation in power. Individual freedoms are, and rights of citizenship are now more guaranteed. The press and the media operate with no limits to their freedom of expression. And after a break of more than two decades of authoritarian regime, the military return to their professional duties. But nowadays, there are voices defending their intervention in the light of the crisis, with support of some minor, minor groups. Generally speaking, however, I think that da Robert Dow's principles of participation and contestation have been relatively assured in Brazil in the last 30 years. Such improvements do not mean that democracy is fully consolidated. The real existing political regime presents important flaws and distortion in its functioning. This is especially the case of the practice of abuse of power, particularly the systemic phenomenon of corruption and the disrespect to fiscal control laws, indicating that the rule of law and the accountability system are not yet completely established in the country. Even so, there have been, since the promulgation of the 1988 Constitution, important advance towards the formation of a system of integrity in the country. And the investigations of the so-called car wash operation revealed the capture of central parts of the state by the economic power, colluded with leaders of political parts and public bureaucrats. As, as to the two process of impeachment of democratically elected president, in both cases the incumbents were accused of abuse of power. And in the recent case, although the Congress and the Supreme Court acted according to the Constitution, to monitor and to control politicians, political parties, and the parliaments, and effectively responded to the irregular situation, the political outcomes were traumatic, dividing the country, involving conflicts among political parties and sects of the civil society, and stimulating a culture of political intolerance and instability, which still remains to the present. As to political representation, it also ev evidence flaws and political imbalance involving specific electoral mechanisms that lead to inequalities of the voting process in some states. The specific modality of party coalitions in proportional elections often distorts the vote, voter will. And the system of proportional representation with open list of candidates related to two big electoral districts stimulates the competition among candidates of the same party turning it uneasy the creation of political connection among citizens and representatives. Also, specific institutional rules incentive part fragmentation and weaken the multi part system. But the democratic deficit refers also to the unequal political inclusion of different segments of the population, such as the imbalanced representation of women in the parliament, which is less than 9%, while the per, their percentage in the Brazilian population is over 52 of the total of the, of the population. The representation of black and Indian descendants in the parliament is equally very low, indicating that the process of citizenship consolidation is not yet complete in the country. Another critical dimension of the political system refers to important asymmetries in the functioning of the legislature and the executive. While the former concentrates many powers in its hands, as the power to decree provisional measures which immediately change the status quo, the latter faces limits in its ability to oversee and control the government majoritar majoritarian coalitions. And this affects the performance of politicians, political parties, and the parliament itself. Such limits do not question 
the existence of democracy in the country, but question its qualities and its strongly influenced citizens' evaluation of the functioning of the political representation. Even so, this unprecedented longer duration of democracy in a historic, cultural, and social context usually regarded as poorly favorable to its deep rooting points to the need to explore more deeply some central dimensions of the crisis of the democratic regime in order to define, in order to know, in order to ad advance the knowledge about its nature. I start with considerations about the executive legislative relations under the coalition of presidentialism. The Brazilian National Congress is an unpopular institution, even as its performance is considered to be a guarantee of governability in the country. Nearly 80% of the Brazilian population lacks confidence in the institution, and less than 20% of Brazilians rate its performance over the past decades as ex excellent or good. Still, just as important is the fact that each one of the Brazilian parliamentarians themselves consider high or very high the constraint posed by provision of presidential decrees for the full exercise of their legislative functions. And no less than 93.5% of them have also classified as high and very high the influence of the executive on the institution's performance. And even with 72 of the parliamentarians considering the role of the National Congress relevant for decision making in the public interest, close to 40% of them assess as low and very low the efficacy of the institution tools available for them to adequately perform the function of legislating, controlling, and overseeing the executive. Nevertheless, the majority of Brazilian deputies and senators responds positively to the proposals of the ruling coalitions transmitted by government and party leaders. This disciplined behavior has been preponderant in the pattern of executive legislative relations and, have, and has led the literature to redefine the concept of coalition of presidentialism as coined by our branches in 1988, when fears about the functioning of the political system emerging from the democratic transition were still widespread. Limongi and Figueiredo uh, mostly contributed to change the course of the debate by showing that, unlike the original thesis that enumerated a host of factors causing ongoing risk of political instability, especially the risk of paralysis derived from conflicting executive legislative relations, the country would have consolidated political systems similar to par parliamentarianism that not only ensures the capacity of the executive to have its views and policies enacted in parliament, but also the president's quasi-absolute domination of the political agenda. In fact, in the, in the, the 1987-88 Constitution Assembly maintained the prerogative granted to the president by the authoritarian regime, particularly the right to initiate specific legislation. As with the formal decree law, the institutionalized, institutionalized the executive's exclusive power of issue, provisional uh, presidential decrees. Sorry. The executive exclusive power of issue, uh, uh, provisional presidential decrees, they, they ratified the unilateral presidential prerogative introducing tax-related legislation and the federal budget, and the same effect that they enlarged the president's competency over the administrative organization of the state, the number of armed force groups, troops, and international treaties. In a few words, Brazilian presidents can, at their discretion, initiate legislation in selected areas and unilaterally force the legislature to consider it by le leveraging constitutional prerogative, as well as procedural rules that have centralized the decision-making process in the Congress in hands of the directing board and the College of Leaders. Presidents can thus preempt congressional minorities from becoming veto players capable of blocking governmental initiatives. Moreover, in addition to controlling the allocation of posts and offices to its power base, 
the executive controls the sanctioning of amendments sponsored by individual parliamentarians who submit them when the federal budget is approved. In this context, the concept of governability became one of the cornerstones of the mainstream of Brazilian political science, sustained that the political system guarantees the condition necessary for government to rule in spite of the asymmetries involving the executive legislative relationship. Since the promulgation of the 1988 Constitution, the executive won a great predominance on what the Congress usually passed, became greatly su successful as regards what is sent to be examined by the lawmakers. This pattern remained effective while the president respect the assumption according to which minority governments form the governing coalition on the basis of actual parties representation in Parliament. The important question this general picture raises is, was there a trade-off between governability conditions and the democratic role of the National Congress when the Brazilian political system was restructured in 1987 88 Those limits for the performance of the con Congress are structural or do they depend on the virtuous performance of political leaders? And what are the implications of those limits for the principle of political representation? The full predominance of the executive over the legislature in the institutional organization such forth in the 1988 Constitution is a case in point here. The governability built was to some extent constituted at the expense of aspects or dimensions of the institutional role of the National Congress. The prerogatives granted to, to the executive allegedly increased so much the margin of success of its initiative that although without precluding the autonomy and the independence of the parliament completely, they tend to limit it. In other words, even if initiative of laws and approval of policies have to be passed by the Congress, the prerogative granted to presidents make most easier the organization of major government coalitions ensuring the approval of what the executive proposed. But this pattern may inhibit the duties of inspection and control proper of the parliament in the regime of separation of, of branches. Some examples may help to understand the implication of the aforementioned limits. The main one refers to the constitution requirement, Article 84 of the Constitution, according to which Brazilian presidents have to render accounts of their administration to the National Congress annually, and the obligation of the parliament as provided for art for in, in Article 71 of the Constitution to examine such render of accounts and inform the society its outcome in 16 days. 60 days. This constitutional requirement takes place by means of very specific legal steps. A. First, the accounts have to be examined by the Federal Accounting Courts, TCU, TCU, an advisory entity of the National Congress. Second, the budget Joint Commission of the National Congress is supposed to examine TCU's report and certify the legality and honesty, honesty of the accounts and authorize, if is the case, uh, uh, new expense in the subsequent year. Sir, so, the Commission prepared a legislative decree that should be approved with the budget submitted by the executive. The theoretical premise of this mechanism is clear. The information about government accounts and their examination by the legislature are supposed to be fundamental elements of the public evaluation and judgment, government, and judgment of government's performance, a clear condition of vertical accountability. Data collected for 1995-2010 period, referring to 16 years of both Cardoso and Lula's administrations, attests that while the presidents have rendered accounts annually as required by the Constitution, the Congress failed completely to examine the rendering of accounts year by year. In the case of Cardoso, all his accounts were approved at one single and short session on December 2002, on the final days of his second term, omitting from the public important information that should have been supplied year by year during the administration. This situation was even more serious, considering that the Congress had not examined the account of the two terms of Lula da Silva and of the entire first term of Dilma Rousseff until the beginning of 2016.
I'm not saying that their counsel were, uh, should be critical or were wrong or were, were had problems. The question here is whether the Congress was able to examine or not, and at the same time, in examining their counts, to inform the population, inform the society about the results of this uh, important procedure. The omission of the Congress upon failing to examine their counts is based on the fu functioning of the majority coalitions. By failing to examine the annual accounts in, this, in the context of widespread practices of corruption, the majority spares preventively the administration, averting the risks of being required to reject them or even accept the warning of the TCU on the examined accounts, and thus present a negative evaluation of the public, to the public opinion. In other words, a, a pivotal procedure involving the liability of public administrations is not effective and fail to contribute to qualify the citizens' judgment of governments. I turn now to the path system. Brazil has one of the most fragmented path systems in, in the world, and it has emerged more fragmented after the end of the electoral dispute in 2014. 28 parties arrived in the National Congress in comparison to less than 20 in the previous period. This affects the process of institutionalization of the path system or the competitive structure of the political system. While the monopoly of political representation is handed over to political parts, part legitimacy is a relevant condition of the functioning of democracy, and this should be seen as coming from both their performance in the decision-making process and in the electoral arena. This is so because parties are supposed to allocate diverse interests into the political system on behalf of the contradictory diversity proper of complex and unequal societies like Brazil. Parts are legitimate when electors have a positive attitude, consider them necessary for the regime. Survey data show, however, a poor scenario of public attendance of them in, in Brazil. 86% eight percent, eight, eight, percent of respondents said that they did not trust parties at all in 2006, but the figure increased to 94% in 2014. There was also a worrying inversion in the support to the statement there cannot be democracy without parties. In 2006, such one said democracy can work without political parties. <clears throat> but in 2014, 46 said so. Less than 6% in 2006 said to feel close to party, and less than 5% in 2014. And the majority of respondents said they did not feel close for any political party. 94 in 2006 and 95 in 2014. As to the comparison of trust political parties with data of Latino barometer, for instance, for 2011, Brazil was one of the, the three cases with the highest index of party distrust in Latin America. 84 of respondents said to have little or no trust in political parties. Part fragmentation make, makes it extremely difficult for citizens to use elections to kick the rascals out when necessary. The affected number of parties grew during the recent democratic era. Since 2014, the number of effective parties in the Congress is around 13 to 14. The growth of the number of parties is due to very permissive legal requirements, particularly the access to the party support fund and in 2017, while the 35 are registered, more than 50 others are requiring their enrollment by the electoral justice. I did some individual logit logit regression models with survey data from 2006 and 2014 to test the impact for distrust of our important of four important dimensions: part closeness, corruption perception, educational background, and age, age branch. The outcomes reveal that individuals who state they are not close to political parties and who perceive the existence of corruption in government are more likely to distrust parties both in 2006 and 2014. As for the usual social demographic variables, younger and more educated individuals tend also to trust less the political parties. In 2006, individuals with completed and incomplete high school and ranging between 16 and 34 years old 
were referred to as significant variables that increased the chance of political distrust in the country. And in 2014, individuals with complete and incomplete higher education were the ones who increased the chance of distrust of political parties. The analysis showed that almost all indicators of closeness between seats and parts have been failing in recent years, as well as the identification of the former with the latter, especially in 2006 and 2014. It is also remarkable that the vast majority of respondents think that parties, instead of representing society, are more dedicated to the fulfillment, the fulfillment of interests held by the politicians themselves. This helped to understand, for instance, the strong and party anti-part drive seen in the massive popular demonstration in 2017. The most important analytical outcome report, reported related to factors associated with the high figures of distrust of political parts by citizens. This may be regarded as a cognitive mapping that can help to better explain the absence of stable roots of parts in the Brazilian society. Individuals do not feel close to them, and those who consider that corruption has increased in recent years are among citizens who trust less the party. The issue is important because it highlights at the same time two important dimensions of the really existing democracy in, the, in Brazil. On the one hand, it shows that political institutions that hold the legal monopoly of political representation do not manage to win the adherence of a high number of Brazilian citizens. On the other hand, it points to the phenomenon that questions the expected republican dimension of the role of political parties, and that undermines their legitimacy as two of the popular representation. This is the case of parties and parties undue and corrupt misappropriation of taxpayer <coughs> funds in order to ensure their conquering of permanent power. Such factors help to explain the worrying growth in the number of residents who think that democracy can work without political parts. At the same time, regression models used to test hypotheses about this also point out to the fact that the young and more educated are among those who distrust parties the most. This reveals the formation of a segment of critical citizens who disapprove of the performance of some democratic institutions as parties, although being in favor of the democratic regime as such. How to interpret all this? The world expansion of democracy was one of the most important political events in the late 20th century, but the scenario of the first and second decades of the 21st century shows a paradox in several parts of the world. Notwithstanding the important democratic advances seen everywhere, the political dissatisfaction, the distrust of parts and parliaments, and the disbelief of in, political, in politicians and governments have been growing both in new and old democracies. Although a large number of countries have joined the group usually considered to be democracies, even in world areas where the democratic values were deemed as non-existent, the vicissitudes of, the, of their several political regime consolidation process have led some analysts to describe them as hybrid regimes or illiberal, incomplete or flawed democracies. That is, countries where the democratic values have little intensity and dimensions such as accountability and responsiveness are under question. From a comparative perspective, the case of Brazil is singular. The democratic regime is very critical, really, in the country. But what is under question is not whether democracy exists, but rather its qualities. Even after the traumatic case of impeachment, the political institutions play their role but some important factors have to be taken into consideration. Both the pattern of asymmetrical executive legislature relations under the coalition of presidency and the flaws of party system legitimacy, which are central components of the contest affecting the, the way the Congress and political parts are seen by society. The functioning of the coalition of presidency limits aspects of the way the parliament monitors government in view of the instruments concentrating the ranks of presidents, the unbalancing among the republican powers, in fact, affects the performance of the regime and shapes the perception of the public opinion of, of the crisis of democracy. Uh, I think that uh, this description and some of the aspects that I, 
I tried to bring for, for the presentation may show that we are in, a, in an intermediate position among latent and acute crimes of democracy in the country. Thank you. Okay, so after these two very profound reflections about the Brazilian crisis, we open the floor for discussion, questions, Please, you identify yourself. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, my name is Gurila. And uh, I would like to ask you both to uh, evaluate the, the current moment of uh, Brazilian democracy and uh, this, this, price, this, this price of democracy perspective. Uh, but also, considering, considering that um, we are living uh, each day on a system that seems to be more dependent on the, the, the justice system, especially on the Supreme Court of decisions, and, and how this is affecting the, the, the politicians and the, the policy making now on a daily basis. Wolfgang Merkel, Berlin. Uh, one question goes to Maria Hermina. I would, it's just an empirical one. Uh, can you say something about the socio structural uh, components of the protesters and the dissatisfied? Are they evenly distributed across the social strata, or do you have certain uh, cluster? in lower, in middle classes. And the second one uh, to Jose Alvaro, uh, again, what do these trust data about political institutions and parties especially tell us? Uh, if 85 or 84 percent do not trust political parties, uh, I don't know exactly the voter turnout in Brazil, probably 65 or... We have, uh, we have so uh, you have a monetary, um, a mandatory vote. <coughs> then I have to be cautious with my question. But my question would be the discrepancy we always uh, observe between the participation and turnout at the election on the one side, which are somewhere between 50 and 80 or 90 percent uh, and the low esteem for parties on the other side. These voters cannot only be a, a cognitive dissonant. Uh, but in your case, maybe it's different. If you have a mandatory vote, uh, then it is a different situation. Um, I'm also interested in these um, social movements and I, you, you mentioned very well that in 2013 this was like a more broader movement without the classical uh, like um, trade unions and uh, but more like a, a spontaneous movements without a common master frame but broadly like asking uh, improved uh, governments, more public, better public service and and uh, also uh, anti-corruption, and then uh, the later movements were much more anti-government or in favor of, of government. So the, the two different. So more. Uh, so where, where did you see that uh, the change over from from the thirteen movements to the other movements? So it was like from a improved government that was not actually asking for a change of government in two thousand thirteen. Yeah. And afterwards, it was uh, it was it became clearly either pro or or against government movements. And then I have uh, what is for me very puzzling that today, with uh, actually always deteriorating political situation, there's so little mobilization. Can you give some explanation for that? So that's, uh, <laughs> well, thank you for the questions. First, on uh, the relation between um, uh, 
the nature, of the functioning, the dynamic of the crisis at the moment, and the, the role of the justice. I would say that we have here a, a classic situation on one hand, a classic situation of judicialization of politics, related to what we all know that happened after the Second World War, when the affirmation, the, the, the more strong presence of uh, human rights implied that uh, uh, going to justice is a way to make it uh, uh, occur make it effective. But on the other hand, I think that we have, uh, in the specific Brazilian case, uh, the judicialization is also a result, I would say, of a, a flows of the action from particularly the parliament. We, obviously, the Supreme Court has the, the, the responsibility of interpreting the Constitution, but in as much as the parliament, in many uh, important aspects do not uh, take the clear decisions or eventually confuse the decision and then political parties goes to the Supreme Court it's inevitable that the Supreme Court has to answer to this and in a sense uh, to, to occupy spaces that we would, I would say are proper uh, of both the, the, the legislature and the, the executive to work. So uh, I think that judicialization uh, is a democracy implied in one uh, uh, one aspect, one dimension, one more dimension that in a sense is, is uh, uh, intensifying the institutional rights. I mean, uh, even even part of the, the judiciary, I think, is aware of that. And in some in some manifestations of some uh, uh, justice, you, you can you can see that this this is a, is a question that they themselves are also facing trying to solve. Uh, in relation to the question about trust, um, I think, Marco, that uh, we have to take into account that quite different from uh, all democracies uh, in which you have for a long period of time high, high, high uh, levels of trust. In the Brazilian case, I've been doing uh, research of political culture and attitudes since the middle of the 80s. We have, since the middle of the 80s, very high levels of untrust. But the point which I think is, uh, should be taken into consideration, that this is going up in the, in the last four or five years, in a very, I would say, very, very uh, uh, strong way. And the point is uh, that uh, uh, and the association of part of this uh, untrust is both related to corruption and to the perception, often I'm talking about perception, uh, on the perception of corruption, but at the same time on uh, the non-functioning, particularly of some of the democratic institutions like the parties, which means that in a sense this might create a social basis for authoritarian alternatives. That's the impression I have. Particularly, if you take into account that uh, since the middle of the, the 80s, in, 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 the, in the Brazilian case, we have a, a, a percentage around 15, 15 60, 70 percent of the, the, the respondents that have a, a more defined authoritarian position. For instance, now, for the first time in Brazil, after many years, there is one uh, actor presenting himself as a, in a more right-wing position and also evoking the memory of the authoritarian regime that has around 15 to 17 percent of the vote. I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but I mean, obviously, it's in this direction that I would interpret the permanence, the constant permanent, and for so long time, the rates of untrust in the Brazilian case. I mean, if you have in, in critical junctures, if you're having critical junctures, less trust, I mean, it's understandable, but if you have this for a long period of time, by which people doesn't feel represented or eventually in, inserted in the political system, I think we have a problem. Yes, well, about the judicial system, I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on, on this issue. I'll give my impression. I think there are two important issues. One is the issue of judicialization, 
uh, that I think is also due to the nature of the Brazilian constitution. We have a lot of constitutionalized rights, so it's pretty natural that people uh, frame it in terms of, of a judicial dispute. On the other hand, I think that in the there has a, have been a lot of, of change in, in, in Brazil in the last 25 years. Uh, and part of this change implied in uh, the rising of uh, a new generation of people in the judicial system, of young attorneys, judges, and um, Public defenses uh, that don't uh, that that don't owe nothing to the Brazilian traditional elite. They go to this service then through a very uh, tough um, competition, and I think that uh, this is the generation that created the car wash operation with all the problems that it may have. I think that part of the modernization of, uh, of the Brazilian society is expressed in some segments of the uh, judicial system, much more than in the party system. I don't know why. We should uh, try to explain this. Uh, so this is for the, uh, the judicial system. Uh, regarding the, the, the questions of, of Wolfgang, uh, there's, there are surveys made with the participants of mobilizations in, the, in Sao Paulo. We don't have the service for, for the, the, whole, the whole country. And what the, the service show is that we have uh, the mid-income strata well represented in, in this mobilization. In the mobilization against the former government, you have a more participation of high middle-income groups, but anyway, they are very, very similar. Regarding to the, to the, uh, the survey, I should do the, the work and, uh, and continue to see how they, uh, they are structured regarding the different um, groups in the society, but I, there, are, there are other surveys that show that young people are much more distrustful than others. I think this is the same in Europe also. And sure if we have such a difference between the high income and uh, other uh, income straight regarding the uh, distrust. But, but regarding the data I show, I, should, I must do the, the work to, to see how it, how it works. Uh, regarding the, the mobilization, 2013 was in a kind of explosion. And that uh, nobody expected, and, uh, and still nobody uh, really can uh, can completely understand because the people went to the streets were very not not totally spontaneous, but um, um, mobilized by these light communities that exist almost all in the internet and not in the in, 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 in real life, uh, except for part of, 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 of them, with different orientations. You have the right-wing uh, groups and uh, left-wing groups uh, in different, very, very, very different um, demands. Okay? I think that the press and the way the press covers the, the the first mobilizations was crucial for its expansion because we had the televising, we had the, we saw the, the mobilizations alive while we were dining, and this helped to spread this uh, this movements uh, 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 across uh, across the country. The the other ones in 2015 and 2016. I think it's much more due to the extreme polarization during the elections of 2014. Okay? Uh, 
and so uh, the, 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 the anti-government movements were very, which were very, very huge. Although part of these people uh, were in, the, in 2013 also, they were there, but anyway, in 2013, uh, the, 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 you cannot see the, uh, clearly which are the predominant forces in the, in, in the street. Uh, While well, I think in 2015 and 2016, you had uh, one, on one side uh, these mobilizations that also were, were, uh, were headed in a uh, kind of way for uh, black communities groups of not so structured, but on the other way, the proof government were much more based on the traditional social movements like unions, uh, student movements, uh, traditional popular social movements, and, and so on. So I think that it's different. Any other questions? Can we close? Question made by Mark. Uh, this is uh, obviously a very quite interesting question about the, the possible cognitive dissonance the, between people that are untrustful and at the same time goes to vote. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, is, is quite uh, uh, easy to see in, in the empirical research in Brazil, people like to vote, although it's mandatory, when you make the question about whether people would vote if it was not, was not mandatory, more than 50, traditionally, more than, well, traditionally, for many years, uh, for two decades, for more than 50%, nearly 60%, at least in my, my, my service. Nowadays, in the last two, three, three years, this one tended to go down, which in a sense goes in the direction of more untrust. But I think there's, I would agree with you, there's a very, very interesting question here. We have to understand why people that is untrustful in relation to political parties do choose political parties, do choose candidates presented by the political party. This is something that we need more research. And the other thing about social movement, another one, one word about that, I think that uh, when we are talking about the crisis, um, uh, usually, uh, we, we have been concentrating mostly on the institutions, political parties, and less attention to social movements, or what I would say, uh, new, initiative, as a movement, new initiatives that are coming up in different areas and sectors of the Brazilian society. So, uh, in a sense, I would say that uh, 2013 and some movements and some organizations that came after that in relation, association to it, in a sense, is, you know, I always remember one observation of uh, Giovanni Sartori about democracy, when he says, democracy on one side is demo protection, but the other side, demo protection, liberty, freedom, but on the other hand, on the other hand, democracy is also demo empowerment, empoderment, which means that, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, well, there is not not enough research on, unless, to, to my knowledge, about all this new movement. I refer to the new from, from the last two, three, four years. But uh, in a sense, uh, uh, part of we are able to uh, see what they respond and why they are mobilizing and eventually participating is very much related to this idea of uh, to get into the political system in a, in a least being able to exert their, their uh, quality as uh, sovereign, sovereigns of the democratic regime. I think this is a very interesting area that we also uh, need more, more research. Uh, we have a colleague here that has been working on this area uh, in our department, and, but I think we, we, we might, uh, in relation to the movement of the last two, three years, might uh, is to develop more, more, do more research and develop more knowledge about this. Thank you very much for the album and Nina. With that, we close the first part of the meeting, the morning session. We will uh, have a break for lunch.
And then, what time do we resume? Really? What time do we resume? So now it's 12.40, 2 o'clock. So at 2 o'clock we meet again in here. Thank you very much.